Information about the world of running, inspiration to fuel passion and excellence, and ideas for making connections and finding community. You're listening to A to Z Running. Welcome, everyone, to the A to Z Running Podcast, where we help runners thrive. I'm Andy. I'm Zach. This week on the A to Z Running Podcast, we are thrilled to have now two-time Olympian and the U.S. Trials champion, Hillary Bohr, on to talk about championship racing and what it's all about and how it differs from trying to go for a fast time. Speaking of those differences and the nuances of championship racing, three things to think about as you listen to this discussion. Prepare and plan for the race and what that looks like for a champion role and measure of experience and how that influences the decisions you're making and what champs do during the race itself all very fascinating things and you get the glimpse into the mind of a champion with mm-hmm. hillary Bohr soon now before we could do any of that you need to go to a to z running.com click the word follow you also need to head to youtube and the places where you listen like apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, and all the other podcast places Mm -hmm. and subscribe because then you don't have to do the tedious and annoying work of trying to find us when the great content is released well we love to connect with you and thank you so much to those of you who have subscribed and followed along listener comment we talked about hot weather running recently i mean i did because i've been struggling with how to adapt Every single summer, I feel like I'm like surprised by it or something. Um, I've only been doing this for like 20 years. But just slow down, Andy. Just slow down. That's yeah. the answer. Um, so there's a couple of great tips. Um, Gretchen Mills gave a few of them, and I wanted to share them with all of you. And one is um, that she recommends getting a hand towel wet and then draping it over a bowl and putting it in the freezer. So that way it like drapes around your neck perfectly after you're done running. Um, or mm. maybe it's like a workout and you're grabbing them from a cooler or something. And then she also suggests if you have a kid towel with a hood, we have a few of those for our boys, putting them over your seat so that you don't get it all sweaty after a run. I thought that was a really brilliant idea. So thank you all for your many comments. We really appreciate them. Keep them coming. My solution is to simply first, not get hot and second, not sweat. And, okay. and then I don't have any problems with those things. Mm. Impossible tasks there, Zachary. Not at all. Mind over (laughs) matter. Oh, my goodness. Well, speaking of impossible tasks and bringing your recovery products everywhere you go because you have so many of them, like Andy, uh, we find, as Andy would like to point out, uh, that some of these recovery products are quite a bit more mobile and versatile than others. So, Andy, tell us about it. Yeah, I've been taking my R8, my Roll Recovery R8, along with me to everywhere essentially to the park to the pool i bring it with me in the car weddings to yes yeah so i've been traveling around with it because i had a wedding and then to races we went camping so zach used this brave man right after the marathon charlevoix yes you use yeah, it's, it's all over. It's all a blur. Um, yeah. So deep tissue recovery, bringing it with you everywhere you go. Excellent tool and very mobile. So the important thing here is that you can get one too at RollRecovery.com, where you can build your own. And they have a number of other recovery products that are both mobile and useful. Oh, I also want to mention that because of this uh, customizable feature, it makes a great gift. So if you have a runner in your life and you want to get them something really special that they'll use and take with them everywhere they go, the R8 is an excellent option for you. And if you're concerned about buying them something like an R8 and not sure whether they'll use it, putting their name on it enhances the likelihood that they will. This is actually a research thing. Because it's personalized, they will feel more obligation to then use your gift. And then they'll become a better runner. And they can't re-gift it to anyone else. So. (laughs) And they won't want to. Once they use it and they notice the benefits, they'll hang on to it for a lifetime. And if you need to do that, creating your custom R8, go to RollRecovery.com to build your own or build one for someone else. (music) 
this week in the world of running. There is more than I would have anticipated to talk about. Lots of exciting stuff to get to. And on Instagram, I was giving you guys a little bit of the lowdown on the Dybin League championships. And these are like super elite track and field events that happen, like 14 of them. And they're all part of like a series and there's very specific events. These are called diamond events. And during the series, there are points that end up totaling to like a final winner. So Diamond League is the world class international track circuit. Mm -hmm. It happens every year. It's the same schedule. I mean, every once in a while they tweak something or there's a new location that props pops up every now and then. But fundamentally for years now, it has been the international track circuit. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to go and run fast times, if you want to go and compete well, if you want to make some money in track, you got to compete at the Diamond League. Yeah, so recently we've had a few of them. In fact, we have two that we're covering this week. Happened only like three days from one another. Crazy stuff. So the winner of the Diamond League receives $30,000 in a Diamond League trophy. And each first place finisher in every single event will get $10,000. So in track and field, that's good money. It is. Now, one more clarifier there is that so you win the league by gaining the most points in your discipline, in your event. So like you win the 5,000, for instance, and that's a $30,000 cash prize. Um, But how it breaks down is that there might be 14 or so competitions throughout the series, but not every competition features every diamond event. And so you might compete in the 5,000 five times over the course of this series if you ran each of them. Um, And as a consequence, it really creates an opportunity for athletes to schedule their season well. It's not like you have to be competing constantly in order to really go for the cat and go for the cash. Um, but then you also can, you can earn the cash prizes along the way, even if you can't compete in every single event. And so it's, it's really kind of broken down well to provide opportunity for the professional athletes to make a little bit of money. Mm-hmm. Now contrast that against any other professional sport and it's chump change, but <laughs> that is the way track and field works. Yeah. So let's talk about the men's miles act because it was crazy. It was. So this was Oslo, which was Thursday, July 1st. And in the men's mile, which is a very uncommon event, by the way, to be competed internationally. It's, it's rare to see a full mile event, but they do it once in a while. And when they do like now, if if the fast people show records fall. So Australia's Stewie McSwain, McSwain, who holds number of records now for Australia um, and is going to be competing in the Olympics and a very real threat for medal contention in the 1500 5k because he's excellent and has been competing well. Well, he won the diamond mile in a blazing 348, specifically 348.37, which is now a new Oceania and Australia Record and that's over Craig Mottram, the great Craig Mottram's previous mm. record, which is really. And he something. said full mile. He's not saying fifteen hundred. I just want to make sure that you uh, all <laughs> understand this is a full mile. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was also a good day for Australia in general because Jai Edwards, who will also be in the Olympics in the fifteen hundred, finished third in a three forty nine, which was Stella fast. By the mm. way, in second, Poland's Marcin Lewandowski. Also will be at the Olympics, um, ran a new Polish record for 349. And Uganda's Ronald Musigala, in uh, just a little bit further back in the race, set a new Ugandan national record for 353. It's a good day for running. Good day for running. Speaking of running fast times, the men's 3,000 meter was also thus. um, And specifically, it was Yamif Kajelcha of Ethiopia, who... And now is going to be running the 10,000 at the Olympics, which is fascinating choice for him because he's traditionally known for his like 3,000, 5,000, just crazy speed, but speed at the end of these longer races. Well, he's going to try his hand at the 10,000. Mm. Very real threat for a medal, um, especially after seeing his raw speed in the 3,000 here where he set a new Diamond League record. That's a big deal. 726. All right. That's very, very fast. And he just dragged everyone along. The next seven behind him, so eight total, all ran personal best times for the 3,000. Wow, that's what you like to see. That that's exciting. Is exciting. Because it happened, Karsten Wilhelm of Norway broke the 400 meter hurdles world record. Wow. Yeah, so we don't talk about 400 meter hurdles, but you know, it was a world record. And we got we to gotta talk about it. I mean, we don't usually talk about like 400 because it's not distance running. But when people set, you know, world records, we tend to add those in. 
<laughs> yeah, and occasionally because people like CJ like sprinting, will tell you something about sprints. So there you go, CJ. <laughs> now, Rye Benjamin is uh, the USA's best hope for a medal in the 400 meter hurdles at the Olympics. Um, and if you recall in the trials, he missed the world record by 0.05, oh, it's gonna be epic. five hundredths of a second. Carson Warholm just broke it by eight hundredths of a second. Yep, yep. And that's going to be an awesome race. It's going to be <laughs> so fun to watch. Yes. I'm personally very excited about this next one. The women's 800 meter run here at the Diamond League event. USA's Kate Grace, who's been on the show before. She finished fourth at the trials. It was heartbreaking because she's was in such good shape. She is in such good shape. Well, she won her very first Diamond mm. League event. Making money. Running a lifetime best of 157.6. Wow. Yeah, Kate. Yeah, too bad it was four days too late, which is exactly <laughs> the reaction that was on her face after the race was like, where was this four days ago? She was kind of the word they used, the announcers used was chuckling. And she really did look like she was chuckling after the race because it was like, wow, that was great. But it was four days too late. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's the kind of thing. Well, by the way, <laughs> she wasn't done there. So we'll come back to her in just a little bit. But she did win the race, not just in a fast time, but she won over the defending world champion of Uganda, Halima Nakai. So mm. she's racing well. Yes. Unfortunately, the end of her season is going to be in the Diamond League, not at the Olympics. But there's a lot more Diamond League races. And if Kate Grace keeps up this momentum, at the very least, she's going to make some money this summer. It's good. Now, we were talking about Ailish McCulgan. In the 5,000 meter run here in the Diamond League event, not at the British Championships, she ran a new British record, which was held by Paula Radcliffe, which is a household name for many runners or track fans, distance running fans <laughs> around the world, in a time of 1428.55. Now, get this it was such a fast race that she was fourth. Yeah. In the race. <laughs> Running 1428. Well, when you have world champ Helen Obiri of Kenya pulling the thing along at a blazing pace, that kind of thing happens. And so Helen Obiri did win, which, by the way, is encouraging a lot of people to reconsider her for medal favoritism for the Olympics as well. She, she didn't look like she was in the greatest form all season, but she's definitely coming into it at the right time. I feel like those are always the talks that are happening. <laughs> you know, is. we're talking today's topic is championship racing. Right. And what we have to think about when these athletes are doing their early season stuff is that they're still in, you know, these early, early season, yeah, early <laughs> season, sometimes not even in like you know, racing shape yet. And they're yeah. just taking advantage of opportunities or getting the qualifying time that they, you know, want to be able to hit early so they can really hunker down and focus on the championship races. Mm -hmm. That's it. So on Sunday, July 4th, in Stockholm, Sweden, was the next installment of the Diamond League. So only a few days later. And uh, by the way, we've linked coverage so you can watch these races as well. Yes. Um, BBC coverage, in fact, which is always better than NBC's coverage of everything. Yes, I said it. Well, you also can watch the full or examine the full results of the Diamond League's uh website as well but um we did we we did uh follow this next event a little bit more closely yes uh as andy will love to tell you yeah so the 3000 meter steeplechase leah fallon's you hear us talk about her all the time super fans because she's you know a champion of character but also she is someone who runs super super fast and now she if you remember she fell in that olympic trials race and she was separated from you know the the next person it was the top three ladies in a big separation well, Leah had fallen in the race, and it was it was really heartbreaking to watch. But for the fall, she would have made the team. Yeah. Got back up, of course, and then got back up again to, you know, run in this Stockholm event. Gotcha. <laughs> so she's like, let's get back to racing. I am super, super fit. And she showed us that because Leah Fallon finished in the fifth fastest time in U.S. history for the 3,000-meter steeplechase mm. in a personal best time of 916.5 nine excellent wow congrats to leah very exciting stuff speaking of usa women who almost made the team and are running the diamond league circuit you notice there's a lot of this and what tends to happen is uh, you see this a lot where after the trials the ones who didn't make the team now don't have the olympics to prepare for and so they're hitting the track racing hard because they're in great shape 
And so that at the very least, I can compete well, maybe get some PRs, maybe make some money. Right. It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. So in the women's 1500, a little bit of that was happening. It was uh, Ethiopia's Deribe Welteji of uh, uh, four flat point six for the winning time. Um, and then the next two spots were both U.S. women who almost made the, yep. the Olympic team. Shannon Osika, who was fourth at the trials, running a personal best now of four flat point nine in this Diamond League race. And then Helen Schlachtenhofen, who... Uh, ran a personal best time of 4.01 after finishing fifth at the U.S. trials, coming back for this Diamond League race. And now we can't compare because, again, we're talking about championship races. We're talking about, like, big events where they're racing one another. It's not just about time. and But those times were faster than the times at the Olympic trials. Um, oh, and they would be because it's paced and, and there's I mean, more international competition. Yeah, except yeah. for Ellie Pereira, who, who ran a faster time. So. Yeah, because yeah. she just decided to obliterate everyone. Right. The men's 1500 was also an interesting experience because if you recall, we've been talking about Kenya's decision to leave off their 1500 team world champion, Timothy Chariot, who clearly when he's not like, you know, hurt has the best chance of meddling for Kenya because, you know, he does that. Um, he's also got a 328, 1500 PR, which is crazy fast. Uh, well, anyway, they said they were going to leave him off the team. So he came back and he showed that maybe... That's a bad idea by winning the Diamond League 1500, running 332, which he's run 330 earlier this season as well. Um, so it's not that, that he hasn't run fast times, but a decisive victory at the Diamond League, which shows his stuff. Now, Kenya could come back and say, yeah, he's still on the team. That That is a possibility. And it's possible that they intentionally left him off the team initially um, out of concern for maybe he wasn't in the best shape. And then he goes out and does things like this to prove that he is. So we'll mm -hmm. see. So this is interesting. We're talking about Kate Grace again. I had messaged her and I was like, hey, will you give us a recap of that amazing PR that you got? She's like, well, just wait, maybe I'll give me another day. Give me another, you know, give me a little bit because I'm running these other events. And she knew this was coming. She knew oh, yeah. she was going to run fast again. And she did. She got another PR in the 800 meter run of 157.36, three days after she yeah. got that previous personal best time and first Diamond League victory. That is a really solid week of running for yes, Kate Grace. Absolutely. So naturally, she showed up at the trials, did what she could on that day, and finished fourth. But now, after the fact, is kind of proving to herself, like I've got this. Like I'm there. Unfortunately, it didn't happen on that day. But she's having a, a and great getting, you know some accolades as well as maybe some money, some money in her pocket. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Also on Sunday, July 4th, this time across the pond back in the United States in Atlanta, Georgia was the peach tree road race, the famous peach famous. tree 10,000, 10 K road race. The also the USATF 10 K road championships, which is, it's almost always the championship as well. And so peach tree is like the biggest 10 K in the world on the roads, um, which, you know, makes a difference for these kinds of things. Cause it's always exciting then and always competitive. Mm -hmm. Speaking of fast people, Sarah Hall, she took that race. So this is now her 11th USATF road title. That's and no small thing. No, it's not. And her close was incredible. The last 400 meters is where she made, you know, her move. And she put eight seconds on second place uh, finisher. So mm. incredible. Which was Emily Durgan then in second. And that is something. So Sarah Hall has uh, quite the repertoire. You know, she's been excellent at 1500 meters up through the marathon um and so then when she does something like a 10k on the roads and you know shows that she's got she's at 38 years old she's still got some of that closing speed you don't want to mess with her and uh she pulled it off big win yep 11th title that's great for the men sam another <laughs> impressive win yeah yes. sam Chalenga. So Sam Jalenga has been on the show before. If you missed his episode, we'll be linking to that. So all the people that we've mentioned who've been on our show, we're going to link those at a to z running.com so that you can listen to those episodes. Very inspiring runners who are doing things right now that are very exciting. So Sam Chalenga, he won and he broke the race apart with about 1K to go. So he broke away from people like Galen Rubb, Jake Riley, who are representing the U.S. in the marathon in Tokyo just incredible field of runners that he was able to challenge and then win against. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and this one in particular was an interesting one um, because you did have the entire men's marathon team for Tokyo was in the race. Um, Abdi finished in 15th, and then Galen and Jake were close together somewhere around like 7th and 8th or something. Um, and so, you know, that was that's interesting just to kind of see where they're at. They're obviously not focusing on that race, so uh, who knows exactly what the intended effort was there. If I am their coach in that moment, I'm telling them, don't break the bank right now. That would be a terrible idea a month away from the Olympics. So we'll see. We'll see what they've got in the games. But also then, the second-place finisher, Fred Huxham, was kind of like an unknown there. And to finish second is quite impressive. But it's also something of nearly a minute and a half PR for the distance for 10K or 10,000 meters that's in huge. any format, whether that's it's gigantic. the track or otherwise. Um, so that's huge, yes. Uh, and, and he may or may not have even qualified for an elite bib because he did not have his name. On his bib, he just had oh, the wow. number, which generally means he, he did, just he signed wasn't up for the race. And, Who yeah. knows? <laughs> but that's quite <laughs> a run. Second, and then we're wow. excited about third place because it was the 15k road champion from back in March, whom we've had on yes. the show, Clayton Young. Yeah, congrats to Clayton. Absolutely. Yeah. So both the men's and the women's uh, fields were very strong, and previous guest on the A to Z Running podcast. Shawana White. Remember, we talked about social running with Shawana. She was second place for the Masters division. Masters, all right. And the winner is the A to Z running follower Gina Rouse, who's super super fast, by the way. I, I thought I thought everyone that we talk about is an A to Z running follower. <laughs> Why would we talk about someone at all if they're not? An, <laughs> interesting. Hmm. I've been misled. Well, speaking of the Olympics and some general knowledge updates, I'm going to be quick here because we've been talking a lot, but the matter here is that there are some fascinating and unfoldings that is always good to be aware of. Like Cole Hawker, if you recall, did not have an Olympic standard, so then it went kind of to the uh, evaluation board in the U.S. about whether he's ranked high enough and they want to send him to the team even without a standard. And, of course, uh, they are. So the decision, the con confirmation has been announced that Cole Hawker will go as uh, the 1500 meter trials champion, which is great and not no surprising shocking. at all. Um, also, uh, several nations have now released their kind of official team lists. Um, at this point, nearly all of the nations with a substantial team have announced their lists. But some of the more recent announcements included Canada. So we've linked to these, by the way, so you can kind of see who's who of these things. Uh, Canada, Australia is another one, which does include as a discretionary spot. We expected he would previous guest Oliver Hoare. Congrats, so, Ali. Yes, and uh, his his work has paid off. He's going to be in the games. Now we get to find out just how well he can finish. It's going to be exciting. The Netherlands released their list, including the name Sifan Hassan. Of course. Not surprising there, but the point being she's one to watch because she's uh, in real metal threat for whatever she's doing there um, and because she could medal in anything, which is kind of the point. But uh, it's exciting then to see what she does, especially head-to-head -head against Latessen Betgade of Ethiopia. Yes who broke her world record in the 10,000. Mm -hmm. Japan announced their team, which is always interesting because Japan's always going to be a threat across the distance events, men and women. Uh, but they're especially paving new roads in the marathon lately, and so it's going to be really interesting to see where their marathoners finish. They've got a 205 marathoner, Suguru Osako, who's going to be in certainly medal contention if he's holding well. And then also on the women's side, they've got a 220 marathoner. So there, there's a lot of interesting things to watch for the Japanese distance runners. Now, if if you recall, Osako also, we've mentioned him previously because back in May, he ran the Portland Track Festival. He runs in the U.S. predominantly. He trains in the U.S. He runs for one of those Nike teams. But he uh, ran two 10,000-meter heats in one meet, <laughs> like back-to-back. -back. Oh, he yeah. won the A heat, that. yeah, and then ran the B heat and finished second. Um, and, and was basically like, ah, it was a good workout. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, he's going to be in the marathon, and uh, that will be exciting to see, too, mm -hmm. where he finishes. By the way, I have linked the competition schedule for the olympic games so if you'd like to know when are these events we'll kind of give you more of the some of the updates in the specifics soon but uh, we've linked the schedule for the game so you can actually find out when these things are happening and of course you know when nbc is or isn't actually covering any of it and then you can go try to find coverage that's streaming from someone else so that you can actually watch it all right uh oh one more here this is yeah. so interesting spain announced their team as well headlined by 50k race walker jesus angel garcia who at 51 years of age has just broken the record for the most appearances in the olympics in track and field 
marking his eighth appearance as a Spanish race walker in the Olympics. Amazing. So that means Amazing. his first Olympic Games was in 1992. I was born before that, barely. Um, <laughs> in 1992, his first Olympic Games. And in 1993, he won the world title in the event. And so now here we are in 2021. Wow. And at 51 years of age, he's back again. So cool. Absolutely incredible. So cool. Eight By the Olympic way, teams. Yeah, and he was his best finish is fourth at the Olympics, which was in 2008. And he, as recent as 2016, he was in the top 20. So it doesn't really matter that he's 51 years old. He's really good Watch at the out. race walk. So. Watch out for that old man. That's he's exciting. That old. That's not old. Oh, that was so mean, Andy. Well, we <laughs> need to talk with Hillary Bohr. So yes. let's get on to the main topic. recently been talking a lot about championship races. In fact, the Olympics is a championship race where it's all about how high you can place. Now, the tactics are a little bit different for championship racing, so we're going to learn how in a, a champion races. Hillary Bohr is coming on the show to talk to us about this topic, and Hillary Bohr is now a two-time Olympian. He represented Team USA in Rio, and then now for the Tokyo Olympics, he's a two-time U.S. champion in the 3,000-meter steeplechase in 2019, and then most recently as the Olympic trials champion. He's represented the USA at the World Championships. He's also won a Diamond League race this year. Hmm. And Hillary took full advantage of 2020 and the opportunities that were sent his way, getting personal bests in four events. So we're so excited to talk to Hillary Bohr about championship racing. Hi, Hillary. Welcome to the A to Z Running Podcast. Thank you. Well, we're so excited to have you on. First of all, congratulations are in order. Congratulations on winning the 3,000 meter steeplechase at the Olympic trials. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You know, it means a lot. It was a big weekend for me. Mm. Oh, for sure. Making your second Olympics and having such an amazing race. Well, this week on the episode, we're going to be talking about championship races, and you have a lot of experience competing at a high level and having this champ championship race experience. And we would be remiss, and our audience would be mad at us if we didn't start with the Olympic trials. Would you mind talking us through that race for you? You know, going, uh, you know, going into Olympic trials, uh, it's something you have to prepare like uh, in advance. So like four weeks before the trials, I was going through my head. Every run I was just going through my head, like what do I need to do to make the team? So you go through a lot of scenarios, like what happens gonna if the race is gonna go fast? What happens if the race is gonna go slow? But I had all those structures in my mind, like, you know, the good thing I had experience because I've run the US championship the last four years. So I had two, I had two plans, you know, if the, the race go fast, then well, I, I think that was going to favor me in any way. If the race was going to go slow, then I was a little bit nervous because I you had a lot of guys who are really good 1,500 meters, like Mason Felix just ran 3 the five, And you don't want to wait for the kick for that. And, uh, you know, I, it's just like the good thing with the steeple jazz is it's more technical. It's more technical. Uh, you have to really have a good uh, a good huddling and then you have to have a really good water, water jump. And going to the race, my plan was just uh, position myself from the first lap, stay out of trouble, and uh, stay on the second position, third position, all the way. I was just going to stay, be in the second or third position. If somebody go be around me, I was going to go around someone else, just to position yourself, because you don't want to, you know, sometime in racing, especially championship, uh, there's element of surprise. So someone can take it out, and you know, if you're not ready, it's so hard to catch up. So... My plan was just go there, stick to the second position and just wait and wait and wait. And then, you know, 600 to go, I was like, okay, it's time to make a move. And uh, I tried to make the move, but in my mind, I don't want to be the one leading from the 600 to go. Because if you're leading 600 to go, you really don't know what the people behind, behind you are feeling. You don't know how they their strategy is. So I took the lead, but... I kind of slowed down intentionally to let someone else go around me. And, uh, you know, uh, in going back in April, when we had a race in Eugene, the first uh, 
that uh, Bree Diamond Lake uh, was the same guy. It was uh, Mason Fair Lake, uh, Isaac Abdai. And uh, when I I took the lead, eight hundred to go, and Isaac Abdai took the lead, just right after four hundred, and he just took it off, and I couldn't respond. So I didn't want the same thing to happen to me, especially at the bigger stage. So I kept rewinding that in my mind over and over. So when I slowed down intentionally, I sat up like one around me and I was like, okay, this is this is what I needed. So my plan was just stay relaxed until 250 and try to just attack really hard and just, you know, make a move. And if it works, works. If it doesn't work, then it's not your day. And uh, when I made that hard move, the 250 to go, it was perfect move and, you know, I was just glad I, I came out with the win. Yeah. Well, so watch- if, if I can if I can just kind of react to that. Yeah. So we watched the race um, a couple of times, actually. And uh, so it, what you just described there, you know, watching you as the race is unfolding, and you mentioned you were trying to stay in position the whole time. You didn't want to yes. let too many people get in front of you. You didn't want to lead the race, but you wanted to stay right there in position. And we saw that happening, you know, as it's unfolding. Um, that's very yeah. savvy execution. And then late in the race there to make the choice, as you did, um, you, you threatened the race like with about 600 to go, what you're saying. Yes. And that made you could see a lot of the other runners um, concerned. They responded right away and Isaac Updike went around you. And so they were immediately starting to think that this is when the race has to happen. But it almost yes. looked like you tricked them into thinking that at the time, because like you said, you then you then you brought it back a little bit. And then waited just a little bit longer. And when you made your last move, nobody was ready. Like nobody was ready to counter that move at that time. It was it was game over. And that was an incredible run. Very savvy race. You know, it's just a game of chess. Like you know, it's Abda. He's a, he's been having an unbelievable season. He ran eight seventeen. Uh, Mason Vale. Uh, he ran eight eighteen a day after he ran three thirty five. Keter has been running really well. So those guys were really, really ready. It's just like, it comes down to tactic, like who has a better tactic? Because uh, looking back, I rewired the race. like, oh, Mason Feli was way behind at the 400 to go. Bucheski was way behind at the 400 to go. If you are way behind, like there's no way you can be able to catch up when somebody reacted. And uh, I think Abdai made a mess, uh, to me, he made a mistake taking out 500 to go. If he had waited to find it to go, it could be a different race. And it's just like, it's just calculation doing, just calculating and see like which. So I know my my best advantage over those guys is going uh, going over the huddle. So when I attacked that huddle 250 to go, I knew that I had at least a second or two. And, the, and then when I had that a second and two or two, and then I just take that momentum over the water barrier. And then from the water barrier, probably have give me four seconds. And it's, it's so hard to catch up with that, with the last 150. Mm. That's so true. <laughs> As an observer of that race, watching you and hearing you now tell us about your tactical racing, seeing you in that second spot, like pretty much the whole time, I could tell you were the one in control. And, you know, whether or not it would turn out like, you know, you said that in the end, you're really glad that you were able to execute it to the finish. You were yeah. running your tactical race and your needs for that race and i think a lot of young runners they they are not sure they're always trying to run somebody else's race and don't have a plan going in they're not doing the calculations so what are some of the mistakes that you see run youngers making it comes with experience uh, like you say in experience is just it's like i say i think i've died the way he ran the last 500 probably costed him the the uh, costed him the the team and it just comes with the experience. I've ran these races the last, from 2016, I've ran the same races over and over. And um, I think it, even with the NCA, going through the NCA, especially like the conference and championship, it keeps you that you learn through it, you learn through it. But then to be that position, especially at the highest, the biggest meet of your, literally your career, cause like to be an Olympian is what everybody is training. So with that experience, you really need that experience. And when you have that experience going to the race, you just have to have the plan, the plan. And just when you have that plan, you just have to stick with it. Because uh, I think the inexperience for some, like especially young kids, like the young runners, the uh, upcoming runners, just they go to the race, just, you know, some of them are glad to be there. Because like 
And some of them is just like, they go with a plan, but when the rest starts, they just like get carried away because, you know, there's a lot of movement. It's a lot of movement. Like when I'm in the race, especially, I use a lot of, like, I look around sometimes, but with the high watt field, they have a big TV on the front. So every lab I get to glance at the TV and just monitor how everyone is doing. And those are little things just, just going to have you be in control and just run your race. Mm-hmm. So when, because that's the, the idea of being able to pay attention to the other runners in the race. Um, I think you're right that some of that you just have to, you have to just have the experience um, so that you're confident in your own race enough to be able to think about what other people are doing, um, which is, you know, that's that's a challenge by itself. But do you, does it ever cause you more anxiety or more concern? Like when someone else in a race is doing things, does it worry you? And in this particular race, you mentioned if people were passing or if you were falling out of the second spot, um, what's going on in your head when other people are doing things that you don't expect? You just have to, you know, be aware, be aware of your surrounding. Yeah, you know, you, yes, you can have the, the plan I had worked out perfectly, but you can have the plan going to the race and then you go to the race and the plan is just like, you throw it away, the plan, the fast 200 meters. Now it's just like, look, just be aware of surrounding and just go with the best, go with the, how the situation is. But you always know, you really need, especially championship, you know, it comes down to the last 400. It doesn't matter how fast it goes or how slow it goes. It comes down to the last 400. In that case, you have to position yourself you have to really have a good position in the last 400. It doesn't matter what the race is. You just have to have the position in front. Remember, if you run, so I close in for 59. If I have two meters ahead of you, 400 to go, if you close in 58, you're still not going to catch me because I already have two meters ahead of you, 400 to go. You just like positioning. It's just who makes the fast move and is that move really stronger enough to kill everyone else. Mm-hmm. Which is, so you closed in a 59, which was really impressive. Um, and you mentioned yeah. that you were a little bit concerned about uh, if it if the race was too slow and all the kickers, you know, with the 1500 meter speed that some of those guys have, like Mason Furlick, um, and, yes. and that could be a concern. But at the same time, even those even those 1500 meter kickers weren't running faster than 59. I mean, Mason probably split a little bit faster than that for his final 400, but he was so far back that he couldn't catch up to you at that point. Yes, you know, sometimes like Mason has been he's been running really, really, really great the, the whole season, and I think for him, like the way he's been running the whole season, sometimes it's it's a blessing and a curse at the same time because he's been able to come back from that deficit. But you don't know how people are throughout the season, like how the development are. I think that's the that's 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 the dangerous part, like racing against each other and then you beat the same people going to the national the trials. And you have that confidence, like, okay, I may chase these people down. But at the same time, it's different type of strategy. It's different type of race. It's, it's different types of stress. Mm-hmm. So, like, I bet Mason, in his mind, knew that, oh, I'm going to chase these guys down. But in my mind, I was like, I got two meters. I'm not going to let this go down. Yeah. No. So <laughs> it's just like playing mind game. Mm-hmm. So one of the questions that I have in regards to championship racing is how is it different than racing for time, like racing for a qualification? It is different. Like racing for time for at like there's no stress. You don't have a lot of stress. And then, you know, when you're racing for time, you just don't care about, you don't, you know, you don't care about the surrounding. You just race. You just go there, just especially like example with Diamond League or a, someone there's a best setter you just have to follow the base and like you don't really care about winning most of the time it's just like you care about running the time you need to run to run and like racing for championship is like you really have to be in the top three position now it's just it's more like mind games more you just have to calculate everything everything that goes into the race and just execute it to the best of your ability mm-hmm. so which do you prefer I prefer the faster base, but yes, I like the championship. It's just like it comes with a lot of pressure. It's, it's like it comes with a lot of pressure, which is it's more intense. It's more mm-hmm. intense. And uh, 
looking back at it, I think I, I'm starting to be really good at it because I have experience and uh, I've been racing with the same guys on over and over. And, you know, all this comes with, it's just not like going out and training because I, I watch the races of every, or of all my competitors. Like after the finals, I go down and break down, they were 14 of us. I go down and break down 13 of my competitors and just look at what are their weakness, what are their strength. And just because if 14 of us were the finals, you don't know who's going to make the team because those guys are, they are in the final for a reason. So I go back and just try to find the clips of every race of them and just break down each one of them. And so like, okay, this is where I might take have advantage of this guy. And then and just learn them and just, you know, you can't just train and just oh, go to the race. You just have to break down each one of them. And so like, okay, this is how they, they are good at it. This is how their weakness are. So it's more, it's more of just going through the the races and then I, I go back and watch my one of the best tipages as ever, Ezekiel Kimball. And uh, the way he execute, he execute the race is just perfect. So I just watch every race he, that's on YouTube and just learn from it and just try to do the same. Mm. That's awesome. See, that's the difference between like, uh, you know, someone who runs and just goes out and run races and then like a tactician of the sport, because I think even a lot of professional runners don't do what you do looking at the race strategically. And I think, you know, there is so much to learn from you in this way, being a champion, you know, we can all go into a race and think about what are we going to do when this person does this? Because they tend to do really well when they start kicking at 600 meters to go and how am I going to respond? And some of us get into our own heads so much that we don't look at a championship race as an opportunity to, to look at the, it as like the sport that it is and the competition that it is as a, as a unique playing fields with different players. Mm-hmm. So that's really cool. So what are some of the things that you look for? Uh, it's just the same. Like, I mean, just, like you mean, uh, going to the championship race, yeah, so like what kinds of different strategies do you anticipate when you go into a race? What are some that you've thought of? Like you did mention, like you know that some of these other guys might start start going, and so you anticipate and do you know your strategy based on that. But what are some other things that maybe you might anticipate for the Olympics that might be different than in the trials? Yeah, it is. Uh, it is different. And unlike the last two years of, uh, you know, we're missing Chega. If Jagger was there, then the strategy is different. Because you know Jagger takes out 1K out and just try to grind it out. And you just have to position yourself to stay behind Jagger and just hang on and just, you know, run his race from there. Because how that's how he, he destroys everyone. So going to championship, like going to the Olympics, I've raised... Yeah, I'll change it again. So going to championship, I will just... I, I've raised with all of these guys. And uh, each one of them, I know, I know their, I know their strength already, and I know their weakness. Unless if there's a new guy, then that's different. But unlike championship, you know, you have a champions now. You just, they just like, they, they like to grind from the from the start. They just like to push the best. And then you have someone like from Morocco, which is probably the favorite going in. Is just he likes to just because he has really good speed. He has a three that one guy. Three that one in fifteen hour, you just like to sit behind and just wait for the last three hundred. So in that case, for me, it's like you can you know who to position to position with. Like when I uh, there's a guy called McKesey, was a France guy. He used to be a perfect tactician. Every race I want to, especially the Diamond League like, or the World Championship, I'll just sit behind him and not worry about anything because he was just perfect tactician and. He will just know how to, re- to run throughout the race, through, throughout the throughout the laps, and did the last. He will be there in the last lap, and I will just sit behind him. Those are things. Just you look into like who is really good uh, racer, and just try to position yourself with that guy, and just you know you have you don't have to worry about the best changes at the front because you know some people like to best changing, but at the end of the day, you know who's gonna probably win the race, and you have position with this guy. You don't have to worry what's going at the front. That's really something. Mm -hmm. So I am curious. We've, we've talked about a lot of the positive experiences you've had. Um, and especially with now the last two U S titles are yours. Um, 
but what about some of the the big mistakes that you may have made in races in the past? Do you feel like you've made some bad choices that cost you a championship race? Yes, yes. I mean, every race. So remember, twenty seventeen World Championship in uh, London. Uh, although I was I wasn't hundred percent. I felt like I should have made the final. That's the only time I missed the final in the championship race. And uh, and the mistake I made was uh, I took like I, I took the late six hundred to go and uh, which was really a bad idea because these are guys who are it's the best of the they are the best of the best and uh, they passed me two hundred to go and I couldn't react because I was at the front and that that's really bad when you just when somebody passes you you know they have momentum and you don't have time to just catch up with that momentum and that that thing kind of stick with me. Not making the final 2017 kind of stick to me until right now. And then again, 2017, uh, uh, US trials. I almost, I almost missed the, the team because of one mistake I made. Uh, that was in Sacramento. And uh, if you watch that race, the last 200, I tried to pass Cabernet on the outside lane. And I was, I stuck at the outside lane. And by the time I was at the water champ, I was way outside the water jump and Bea and Kebene was able to go through the, the inside lane. And you means like, you think about probably microsecond, you you make the team using microsecond and that kind of going uh, uh, further than cause, almost cost me the team because uh, I beat Bea by <laughs> micro, microsecond. Yeah. And those are kind of mistakes. It's like, it's a small mistake, but when you are like in that kind of championship, you just it can cost you a race mm -hmm. or a team by by say. Yeah, and that and that that point of it's so one small decision, <laughs> one small decision can make such a big difference, and um, that's uh, that's the challenge. And I really appreciate the point that you made early on that experience teaches with these kinds of things because um, you know you only get you only get so many opportunities. Uh, to run a championship level race, you know, it's like usually it's once or twice a year. If there's rounds, maybe you have a couple of extras. But um, so when you when you make a mistake like that, it it takes almost a full year before you get to kind of you know show that you've learned from or try again. And that's tough. Not that's even difficult. a yeah, not even a full year. Sometimes it takes four years. Yeah, if you miss the team, it uh, you have to wait another four years, and and that that's tough. Uh, remember, your competitors, you are probably in the same level. You're probably in the zone level or even better than you sometimes. It comes down to who just had a good calculation during that day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now you talked about how like the pressure is higher for championship races. And now a lot of our audience aren't going to have the opportunity to run at championship events. You know, many of us don't qualify for such things of course um but we do we do still experience some of the higher levels of pressure when it comes to a race that we really care about on the show we've had ajay wilson talking about you know really honing in to focus for events that matter to us i would like to know hillary how you are able to focus for your championship races and maybe give some advice to all of our listeners who have an event that they really care about you know, it's it's tough. It doesn't matter what kind of championship because it's the same same stress level you go through. And uh, so what I try to do for me is just I have the same routine. Like I have the same routine throughout in every race. Like I wake up, get tea, and then I can I get back to the room. Uh, I try to catch a nap. If there's no nap, I try to catch a funny movie. It's just anything funny to just take me out of my take my mind out of the race. And then after that, I just grab lunch. If I can't get a lunch, because sometimes it's too nervous to eat anything. And then the same routine after that, you try to get a nap. If you can't get a nap, then you try to find something good you really enjoy that takes your mind away from raising. And for me, normally it's just, I, I watch a lot of movies or just comedy or just watch, watch sports to just get my mind out. And uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's the things I just normally like to do during the race. Mm -hmm. Routine. That's good. That's a that's routine a very is. good tip. Having a routine and trying to get in that good headspace. 
So if I can uh, just briefly kind of summarize what you've shared here with us, which is just appreciate this this time here with you. So as a as a racer, it's so important that you prepare for every scenario that you have multiple plans because you as you shared, your plan doesn't always work out. So you need something kind of to back up that um, and just getting enough experience over the course of, you know, our, our running experiences, trying to compete at a high level requires experience competing at you know championship levels and that makes a lot of sense and then even in the race itself you shared how important it is to just pay attention to the other racers and what's happening and so you can actually follow your plan well because you know what's going on around you and it does help having the big the jumbotron tv screen to be able to look at when you're going around the laps that's really fun um so with all of that hillary anything else that you feel like is important to make sure that you have the best possible championship race I think the biggest is just to believe in yourself. I mean, the biggest, yeah, you can be the best of shape of yourself. And, you know, if you go there and you don't believe in yourself, it's just like, it's different. Because at the end of the day, that last lap is going to hurt for everyone. It's not, it's not going to be, you can be running 60, I'm running 60, but it's the same vein. It's just who, want, who wants one, who wants more and who believes in, it's just believing in yourself and, you know. Well, trusting in your process, it it starts with the what you do from the last four, the training, in the build up. You know, for me, especially before the race, I, you know, especially the night before, I like look back and look all my trainings. Like this is what I did. Well, so so appreciate that advice, and that's you know that's the you said that's kind of maybe that's the most important thing, which is just knowing the work that you put in and believing and trusting that you've you've worked hard for this. You can believe in yourself and compete well in the moment. That's great. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Well, we appreciate your time immensely, especially when you're you know you're in the midst of it here as you're now preparing for the Olympic Games, and we wish you the best, and we'll definitely continue to follow your career as it unfolds. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you to Hillary for giving us the inside scoop about championship racing from a champion himself. So if you want to follow, make sure you do that. If you want to look at his world athletics profile, we're going to link to that too. And I wanted to bring us back to why we want to understand championship racing. And that's because we want the fanship of this sport to rise because the sport only gets better if we can understand the top level and to be fans of what's going on at the highest stage of our sport. So championship racing, it's different. I hope that after you listen to this episode, you're going to be able to enjoy watching the tactics even more. Yeah, and I absolutely appreciate whenever you can get into the mind of the best, Mm -hmm. right, in the sport or the best at a level. And so with something like this, you know, what is it that Hillary Bohr is thinking about as he's racing the Olympic trials and trying to beat all these people? And so to hear him articulate that, that was just, it's for me, that is like so sweet because that's the thing that you can't, you can't know that unless you have the person tell you. Um, and so we appreciated that. And I think as, as I glean from that conversation, you know, when we're in the race, it's so easy to be kind of like in our own heads. And especially when I don't feel like I'm competing against the people around me, you know, most of us don't run every race thinking about how I'm going to beat everyone around me. Um, although you should, you should just beat everyone all the time. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, the point being, try, right? even though we're not thinking about it in those terms, we're in this experience surrounded by other runners in the same experience. So there's something to glean there about how do we identify the right level of competitiveness in the midst of these kinds of racing experiences that we're doing. So mm-hmm. there's a lot going on there, but I, I appreciate it. And so we love watching the championships. We're going to see a lot going on with Tokyo. And so when we do be aware of these kinds of reflections from Hillary, like what is it mm-hmm. that's going on in the mind of the racers? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Again, Hillary Bohr's Instagram handle handle is Bohr, B-O-R period Hillary, H-I-L-L-A-R-Y. So make sure you follow him on his, on his journey. Let him know that you listened to this episode and that you loved it we appreciate all of you being listeners of the a to z running podcast and while we may not all be world-class competitors we do all have goals and dreams so if you could use something more in your pursuit of excellence right now check out our training and coaching or coaching services at a to z running.com slash coaching thanks and we'll talk to you again soon